Hallelujah. 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 Good morning, saints. Good morning, saints. Good morning, saints. It's a wonderful day. Stay playing what you were playing. I felt God on what you were playing. Play what you were playing. Come on, band. Come back with me. This is the day that the Lord has made. I feel a praise brewing in my spirit. I wonder if you can just spend a minute just opening up your hearts and releasing every care and everything that would have seek to distract your praise and would seek to hinder the move of God this morning because I believe there is a move of God for this morning for his people I believe God wants to dwell within us Psalm 24 says the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness the world and those who dwell therein for he has founded upon the seas and established it upon the waters but he asks, who may ascend into the hell of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to idols nor sworn deceitfully. Here's a promise. He shall receive a blessing from the Lord. How many people are ready to receive the blessing from the Lord this morning? And he will receive righteousness from the God of his salvation. God has given us righteousness. So we have this blessed assurance that it's nothing that we have done, but it's all what he has done. That make us able now to enter into worship. So I don't care what your week has looked like. I don't care about the challenges of yesterday. There is righteousness for you today. Yes. And that righteousness allows us now to go boldly before his throne with hands lifted up to receive mercy and grace from our God and our King. I'm going to invite you to come to the altar for fresh cleansing. God, I want to thank you for life, family, you carry me through the week. I thank you for your mercy, your salvation, and your loving. I thank you that you woke us up this morning, that not everybody woke up this morning. Some of them are in the hospital, probably dead, probably injured right now. I th Lord. <laughs> I pray that it's That school is about to come up. I pray that it will be a good year for everybody that's going back. That will bless that this school year will be no problems. All schools will be safe. 
you will keep him safe with your blood and uh, your glory. That, and I also thank you for waking me up again to come to church today and praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.
sing the song and I think about the times when I thought I was outside of the reach of God. I think about the times when I was messed up in a bad situation and this good, good father came with his unfailing love. Sometimes I needed a strength to pull me out of the deep deep circumstances that I put myself into. Sometimes I needed his healing and sometimes I needed his provision and sometimes I just plain old needed him to rescue me and I'll be honest with you, maybe you guys are good and perfect but sometimes I wondered if I was outside of his reach. Just being honest. But every single time Every single time, every single time, this good, good father, this good, good God, reached me wherever I was, grabbed me, delivered me, healed me, provided for me, rescued me, and he loved me with an unfailing love every single time. 
Even when I felt like I blew it, like I messed it up. This constant good, good father. Can you sing that I'm feeling love? I'm feeling love. Release that I'm feeling love. So I wonder if we can sing it. Higher than mountain. Yeah. Deeper than ocean. Yeah. Reaches it reaches. Me. Declare it again. I'm feeling love. Sing it from your spirit. Unfailing. So whatever you face this morning, as we go to God in prayer, as autumn leads us to God in prayer, it reaches, it reaches. Look at somebody next to you and say, I don't know what you need, but his love can reach it. Tell somebody else, I don't know what else, whatever you, I don't know what you need, but his love reaches. His love reaches. I said his love reaches. Somebody going to get excited in a minute. His love reaches. So we go before God this morning knowing that his love reaches. Whatever you need, whatever the circumstances. If you need healing, it reaches healing. If you need money, it reaches money. If you're hurt, it reaches your hurt. If you're in pain, it reaches your pain. Put whatever you need in there. It reaches whatever you need. I want to encourage somebody. It reaches. It reaches. The song says it reaches to the highest mountain. And it flows to the lowest valley. That same blood. That same blood. That same blood. Reaches to whatever you need this morning. So as we go, we go to God in confidence. We go to God in boldness as autumn leads us in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you and praise you, Lord God, for who you are, Lord God, in our lives, Lord God. We just worship you, Lord God, in the beauty of your holiness, Lord God. We just submit ourselves, Lord God. We just lay prostrate, Lord God. Unworthy, Lord God. We just we just submit ourselves to you, Father God, in the name of Jesus, God. And I just ask, Lord God, that you would just forgive us, Lord God, of our sins, Lord God, of anything, Lord God, we may have said or done, Lord God, that was not pleasing unto you, Lord God. I pray, Father God, that you would cleanse our hearts, Lord God, that you would purge us, Lord God, remove any iniquities from us, Lord God. Anything, Lord God, that is not like you, Lord God, remove it right now, Lord God. Search our hearts, Lord God, and if there be anything, Lord God, in us, Lord God, that is not aligned up according to your word and your will, Lord God, remove it from us, Lord God. Forgive us for being disobedient, Lord God. Forgive us for being rebellious, Lord God, and doing what we wanted to do, Lord God, when we had explicit instructions, Lord God, to carry things out, Lord God, and to do what you told us to do. Forgive us for that, Lord God. We just thank you, Lord God, for your unfailing love, Lord God, and your grace and your mercy, Lord God, which is so sufficient, Lord God, for us, Lord God. I just ask, Lord God, that you would just continue to just cleanse our hearts and our minds, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that you would just help us to guard up our, our gates, Lord God, our ear gates and our eye gates, Lord God. Help us to watch what we allow in our spirits, Lord God. I pray that you would just help us, Lord God, to help our children, Lord God, to just help them, Lord God, discern, Lord God, the things of you, Lord God, and the things of the world, Lord God, that they will be able to separate the two, Lord God, and to walk in another way, Lord God. And I just pray, Lord God, that you would just help us, Lord God, to just walk up right before you, Lord God, and that we would just, Lord God, just do your will, Lord God. And I pray, Lord God, that you would just help those, Lord God, who don't know you, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, for those that are on their way here, Lord God, who could not make it today, Lord God. I just ask that you would just be with them, Lord God. Give them a safety lane to travel, Lord God. I also pray, Father God, for healing, Lord God. As I read this list, Lord God, of people, Lord God, that is in need of healing, Lord God, I pray that you would touch them from the crown of their heads to the soles of their feet, Lord God. I pray, Lord God, that you would just do, you know the exact need, Lord God, in their body, Lord God, in their spirit, Lord God. You know the healing, Lord God, that needs to take place, Lord God. So as I read these names, Lord God, and present them before you, Lord God, 
I pray that you will individually, Lord God, you are so big, Lord God. You are everywhere at all times, Lord God. I believe, Lord God, that your power, Lord God, through this prayer, Lord God, you will go touch each and every individual, Lord God, as I read this list before you, Lord God. I pray for Pastor C, Lord God. I pray that you would just watch over him, touch his body, Lord God, his heart and his mind, Lord God. I pray that you would just restore him, Lord God, any way that he needs to be restored, Lord God. I pray for Jerry Young. I pray for Sister Michelle Anderson. I pray for Brother Joe Walker, Minister Pat Brown, Lord God. I pray for Sister Donna Robertson, Sister Vi Curry, um, Sister Ian Al Aidens. I pray for Sister Wanda DeRoe and Deaconess Do um, Doris' nephew, Jahid um, Connor. I pray for Minister Joyce Burton, his brother-in-law, Mr. Ron Coleman. I pray for Brother Ron and Sister Gwen Morrison's granddaughter, um, Nazire Cornish. I pray for Minister Jane Brothers, um, Minister Jane's brother, Brother Rick, and Deaconess Yvonne's grandson, Masai. I pray for Sister Barbara Woodson, Lord God. I pray for Minister Deborah Jones, her sister-in-law. I pray for Deaconess um, Ashley Baysmore, her close friend, Lord God, Brother David Miller. I pray for Sister Asia Underwood's friend, Lord God, um, Hope Richardson. I pray for Sister Tarsha and, and Brother Tim Young, Lord God, and Pastor C's niece, Lord God. Um, Pastor Janine Peters. I pray for Pastor C's nephew, Lord God, who is in a coma, Lord God, due to a very serious accident, Lord God. So we just ask right now that you would just touch them all right now, Lord God. Meet them at the point of their knees, Lord God. You said in your word that healing is the children's bread, Lord God, and we believe it, Lord God, and you were bruised for our stripes and wounded for our transgressions, Lord God, and we know the chastisement of your, our peace was upon you, Lord God, and we thank you by your stripes that we are healed. So we claim it already. We walk in it already in Jesus' name and for the comfort list, Lord God, I pray for Sister Verna Charles, her father, Lord God, Mr. John. I pray for Deaconess Sandra Waller, brother, her brother-in-law, and Deaconess Vanessa Waller, um, Peeker's uncle, um, Brother William H. Waller Jr. I pray for Sister Joyce Jackson, her close friend, um, Brother Nehemiah Jacobs, Lord God. So I pray that you will comfort them, Lord God, in the name of Jesus. For any loss, Lord God, I thank you, Lord God, that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, Lord God. So we thank you, Lord God, and we rest assured, Lord God, in the hope that we have. Lord God, of salvation, and that we will see our loved ones again, Lord God. So comfort their hearts and their, their spirits, Lord God. Help them to relish and remember all the good times, Lord God. In Jesus' name, Lord God, have your way in the service, Lord God. I pray that you will cover us, Lord God. Cover this entire congregation. I pray for unity, love, peace, Lord God. Good morning, Fresh and Audi. Good morning. I am here to introduce to you someone who is very special to me. Um, outside of my relationship with Jesus, Shivali is the best thing that has ever happened to me. She is a woman of virtue. She is a woman of prayer. She is someone who, when she gave her life to the Lord, when the Lord called her in her teens and she said yes to the Lord, she never looked back. And one of the things that I was thinking about is when we met, neither one of us was looking for a spouse. We were looking to do God's will. And as I saw her and we became friends, at some point the Spirit of God said to me, you would be crazy to let this woman go. Because if you don't ask her to marry you, someone else will. And you are going to be crying for the rest of your life. So I thank God for my rib. I thank God for my love. I thank God for the one whom I cherish. I know that the word is going to be powerful because she preached it to me yesterday. <laughs> so it is, it, is, it is a powerful word, it is a wonderful word. And so I don't want to, to let any part of it out. She'll be before you in a minute. But at this time, we're going to have Leilani to come before us to give us a blessing in song. Good morning, church. Today I'll be singing for your glory, and my prayer for you is that it blesses all of you. And you don't see me, but you see the Lord. And uh, I actually wasn't planning to sing this song, but I think that 
it was the better choice for today.
Father God, we bless you, we praise you. Lord, all that we do is to glorify you. And so, Lord, when we continue to glorify you, may we continue to say yes. Lord, I pray, God, that your word would go forth, that I would decrease and you would increase, that you would speak forth your word, that it would bring forth truth, deliverance, salvation, hope, and love. And so, Lord, I just commit this time into your hands and ask that your Holy Spirit would speak through me. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, fresh anointing. It is still morning. <laughs> I give honor to the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Savior of my life. I give honor to our pastors who are not here and to our elders. I thank God for my husband, Kenyatta, who has been walking this journey with me now for 11 years and loves me even though I'm sure I get on his every single nerve. <laughs> I was at Nina and David's wedding and I was so glad because David said, I love Nina even though she gets on every single one of my nerves. And I'm like, I'm in good company because I'm not alone. I thank God for Sophia, who God has blessed us with, who continues to teach me patience. And so I just thank God for all that he's blessed us with. And so I just want to get right into what God has laid on my heart. I struggled with this word this week. Told my husband, I don't know, but the Lord confirmed that this is what he would have me to say. And so I just have to be obedient and just speak as thus saith the Lord. There's a lot going on in our world today. The church is being questioned. Christians are being ridiculed and associated with political views. The Western church has a watered down gospel which does not teach us the true cost of living for Christ. We think the Christian life is supposed to be easy, but it's not. We think that we should see blessings all around us, but we don't. See, the devil is destroying our young people. And I don't know if you begin to see the sense that there's a spirit of suicide that's taking our young people out. And the devil is keeping the people in the church complacent. But God is calling his people out of complacency and out of lukewarmness. People go to church Sunday after Sunday to enjoy wonderful praise and worship, to listen to a feel-good message, message, only to return home with the same views, with the same attitude, with the same behavior, no desire to change, living a life contrary to God's word. We expect blessings when we have minimal commitment. Many are teaching the gospel that demands nothing from our lives, but that is not the gospel that Jesus preached. And so my question today is also my title, are you ready to die? The passages of scripture I want to share today come from Mark 8, 34 to 38. And before reading the passage, I want to set up the scene that occurred right before Jesus gave these words. The disciples have listened to parables. They've seen many miracles. They had just seen the miracle of Jesus feeding the 4,000 and healing a blind man. And finally, he engaged them in conversation about who people say he is. As it is today, there were different opinions about who Jesus is. But Jesus specifically asked his disciples, who do you say I am? The outspoken and bold Peter immediately declared, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. What a revelation that was even for Peter. In the book of Matthew chapter 16, Jesus tells Peter that he is blessed and he received a revelation from God. So Peter is in. He's feeling good about himself. He's feeling himself and he's probably thinking, I'm number one in Jesus' book. Then Jesus begins to teach about what is to happen to the Messiah. He starts talking about the topic of death, which is not what anyone really wants to talk about. You don't sit around talking about death with your friends. Yet Jesus told his disciples that he will suffer many things, including death, but there is hope because he will rise on the third day. Here goes Peter, puffed up, full of himself, that he has the audacity to turn to Jesus and begin to argue and rebuke Jesus, the same one he just declared was the Messiah. So you see, despite Peter's proclamation of who Jesus is, it was clear that Peter did not understand the mission of the Messiah. 
The Jews believed that the Messiah would be a political and military deliverer who would rescue the Jews from foreign domination. So how could their mighty warrior who would restore power to Israel die? That could not be possible. So obviously Jesus had no idea what he was talking about. But then Jesus, who had just lifted Peter up, now turned to him and said, get behind me, Satan. See, Peter did not have God's purposes or priorities in mind, but only earthly and human priorities. He became a hindrance to God's purpose, which was for Christ to die on the cross and take away our sins. This was the only way, the only sacrifice, and the only plan for salvation. If Jesus did not die, we would all be lost. God's plans are eternal, but Peter was limited with an earthly human perspective. Satan's plan was to keep Jesus from fulfilling his mission. So Jesus spoke to Satan to let him know that God's plan will prevail. Yes. And after this interaction with Peter, Jesus brought more clarity and spoke these words to everyone so that if there was ever any doubt, he would make it clear what it meant to be a true disciple of Christ. And so begins the passage in Mark 8, 34 to 38. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it, good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. The cost of discipleship. Are you ready to die? Jesus did not beat around the bush. He states clearly what it means to be his disciple. He says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. Let's look at each of these. Why do we even need to deny ourselves? From the garden, self was an issue, and self continues to be an issue. Eve in the garden did not want to deny herself the pleasure of eating the fruit because of what she thought it would give her, even though it was clear that God had forgiven, forbidden them to eat it. Self focuses on our welfare, on me on my desires, my pleasures, my wants, my will, what God can do for me. It's like that me, me syndrome or the I, I syndrome. When we give our lives to Christ, it should no longer be about me, but about God, his purposes in building his kingdom. What does it mean to deny myself? It's given a death sentence to self-centered interests and the me syndrome. It's denying your fleshly desires, denying doing things your way, denying worldly perspective of success, all in exchange for Christ and his kingdom perspective. Self-denial means that I'm putting God first, his plan, his will, his desires. We have to be willing to surrender our way, our wants, our desires, preferences, and our priorities in return to following God's ways, developing his desires, seeking his preferences. When my wants and his wants are intention, my wants must die. It's not half-hearted devotion. It's not one foot in the kingdom and one foot in the world. It's not showing up to church whenever I feel like it or just reading the Bible once in a while or praying to God only when I get in trouble. See, Jesus wants disciples who are sold out with a committed heart, soul, mind, and strength. And there's a larger mission, a bigger story that's bigger than just me and you. There are people who need to be reached even if it inconveniences me. See, it's hard to deny ourselves because the flesh wants what it wants, right? Sin is very tempting, and it seems so much fun. We may wonder, especially as young people, what would people think of me if I don't give in, if I don't follow the crowd, if I don't go to the party of the year? What would people think if I'm still a virgin by the time I graduate college? What would my boys think if I don't try this drug out? Or we think, why should I be inconvenienced? My life is busy. I've got my own issues to deal with. I don't have time to get involved with anyone else's life. Complacency offers us comfort. I'm comfortable right here. I love my life. I love doing what I'm doing. I'm one, I won't have it any other way. The idea of taking a risk or experiencing pain is not even a thought, and it definitely can't be God's way. In our minds, pain and suffering does not equate to God. 
This Christian life should be all about blessings and comforts and enjoying the abundant life that God has promised. So why should I have to deny myself all of the great pleasures and blessings God has before me? Romans 6, 5 to 11 says, since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. Romans 6, 15 to 16, well then, since God's grace has set us free from the law, does that mean we can go on sinning? Of course not. Don't you realize that you become the slave of whatever you choose to obey? You can be a slave to sin, which leads to death, or you can choose to obey God, which leads to righteous living. See, Jesus did not die on the cross for us to continue the pleasures of sin or to be led by our flesh. If we look at our young people, your age and surroundings is not an excuse for sinning. It does ma not matter the school you attend, the neighborhood you live in. It doesn't matter your upbringing. It's not an excuse. I was surrounded by family members who were and continue to be sexually promiscuous. I have uncles who have more than 20 kids with different women. It was just what they did. They drank a lot of alcohol. They partied all the time. I went to high school where teenagers were having sex in the staircase. It's just what they did. People were getting shot for just stepping on someone's shoes. Yet... Being a Christian, I made up in my mind that what I gained from living for Christ was much more valuable than my popularity, than being connected to family, than being accepted by the world. I understood as a teenager that God was calling me to a higher standard, to be different, to be in this world but not of this world, to leave family and everything associated with them behind for the sake of the gospel. See, God told me to give up a lot of things that my friends thought I was crazy. He said to give up the secular music. I did. He said to give up the certain boyfriends. I did. See, I constantly in high school, I had to constantly say no to sex for boyfriends because, you know, I figured, well, I knew that this was more valuable for God. And so I became the nice girl that the boys would just hang out with and they would talk to you and everything. But they knew they weren't going to get anything else from me. And so they would sleep with someone else. And I figured, well, if she wants to give it up like that, then hey, pro power to her. But I wasn't going to do that. And I struggled with self-esteem. And I finally came to my senses by the senior year and realized, what am I doing? But I still maintained that value of what was valuable to God. And I went a different way. I even went a different way from my family and had to distance myself. See, this meant that I had to stop traveling to Antigua for summer vacation so that I would not be tempted to associate with what was cultural or just hanging with family. See, there was a time that I tried to run away back to Antigua because I was living in hell with my mother. And it was just an abusive relationship. And I figured, you know, this was my rescue attempt. My my aunt had signed me up for school in Antigua. I withdrew myself out of my high school and I told everyone goodbye. I was not coming back. But God stopped me in my tracks because the devil had a trap for me. See, God had a plan, but the devil also had a plan. And I was like, well, God, why is it that this is not working out? And through circumstances and events, and eventually my dad passed so that I did not have the legal opportunities to move back to Antigua. And as I questioned God, God's response was this. He said, I'm calling you to a life of holiness and it comes with a cost. I'm a jealous God and nothing will replace me in your life. I am your father and have been your father throughout the years and have kept you and taken care of you. I have called you out of this world to follow me. So what option did I have? I can't run from God or his ways. I tried, but his love pulled me back because he saw what the devil had planned for me. And if I would have went there, I would not be where I am today. His Holy Spirit in me continues to draw me back. And so I choose to follow the path of Christ. And my surroundings were not going to be an excuse for me to sin. I knew what it meant to be entangled with sin, and I chose freedom, freedom in Christ. See, if we receive Christ, we must die to sin. If not, we become a slave to sin. There is no freedom in that. And guess what? Let me give you this small revelation. Either way, you cannot escape death. Sin leads to death. 
spiritual death and eternal separation from God, but dying to self leads to eternal life, a relationship with God. So either way, you will die. So which death will you choose? The Bible says to resist the devil and he will flee. But the problem is we're not resisting. We're giving in and continue to welcome him. It doesn't matter what your friends or anyone else thinks because the one person alone whose opinion matter, who you will stand before on judgment day is God. His opinion is the only opinion that matters. So yes, dying to self means that you may be the oddball. Dying to self means that you may walk this path alone physically. But Jesus is always with you. It may mean missing out on the so-called fun activities. But when you look at the end results, usually they're not pretty. There's loss of identity, there's, de there's depression, there's STDs, there's unwanted pregnancies, and the list goes on. So for those of you also who feel like, well, I'm not sinning. I'm not entangled with sin, so she can't be talking to me. So here's a word for you as well. God is not calling us to be complacent or comfortable. Whether you like it or not, he will inconvenience you. He will move you out of your comfort zone and he will make you uncomfortable. And so the question is, will you be a willing participant or an unwilling participant? Those of us who went on a mission trip to Suriname experienced being pulled out of our comfort zone. You know, no AC, the bugs, the traveling in the dark in the canoe, not having the typical foods that we eat, operating on someone else's schedule. They had to deny themselves the comfort they were used to, but the end result was greater because more than 130 people gave their life to Christ and God's kingdom was expanded. And so missions is not about comfort, but it's about the bigger story, the greater purpose. It's about Jesus. If we're more fo focused on being comfortable, enjoying the luxuries of life, then it's time for us to die too. When we deny ourselves, our lives should reflect light, light and salt and the presence of God to others. As disciples of Christ, we, our lives should show that we follow Jesus and love him more than we love ourselves. And none of us are perfect, including me, but we should try to live right, talk right, walk right. Even when we fall short of God's expectations, we need to get back up and keep trying. His unfailing love continues to keep us and pull us back, but keep trying, don't stay there. We have to constantly die to self, to our comfort, to complacency, to just being ordinary, to what, to, to what matters is what I want. There's too much at stake for you to remain comfortable. We have so much greatness inside of us and many will never know it or tap into it because they're just complacent. They're satisfied with where they are right now. Some people are so bound by fear that they never step out in faith to cross over to the other side of greatness. God has put greatness in each of us, but many go to the grave without ever tapping into it because they were so focused on holding on to their lives. And fear can paralyze you and cause you to miss out on what God has called you to do. So Jesus said, deny yourself. Then he said, take up your cross. And what comes with the cross? Jesus was beaten, he was bruised, he was spat upon, thorns placed on his head, nails pierced through his wrists, blood flowing down his body, and finally death. The cross comes with pain and suffering. Having faith does not mean there won't be sacrifice or pain. You cannot avoid it. It's part of the journey. We have to accept it, carry our cross, face our pains and our fears. Just Jesus understood what it meant to take up his cross because he did so out of a selfless love for us. He was willing to give up the comforts of being with his father constantly by dying on the cross for our sins. And we're called to take up our cross as well. See, salvation is a free gift to all who believe in Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior, but there is still a cost for us. I was listening to the Global Leadership Summit this week, and Pastor Erwin McNeus, the pastor of Mosaic Church in California, shared this, and I just thought it was powerful, and I wanted to include it. He said, for many people, pain defines them, but when we live a life of faith, our pain should connect us to God. 
Your pain is the boundary of your greatness. We have to be willing to go through our pain to step into our greatness. Learn how to walk in your pain. When you go through issues, live with nightmares, end up in the hospital, struggle with your identity, learn how to walk through that pain because pain is not the end of the story. For Jesus, his greatness was on the other side of his pain. God gave us a way through the pain and he did not give us a way out of pain. Trust that God has something extraordinary on the other side of our wounds, disappointments, and failures. See, Pastor McNeus was recently diagnosed with cancer, and he had a six-hour surgery, but he realized that his cancer was not about him. It was about his friends who were atheists and Buddhists and Hindu, and one of his atheist friends who had never prayed called him and said, this is the only reason that I want to pray to God, that he can heal you, an atheist. And so he realized that this cancer was not about me. This was about everyone who needed to know that Jesus can heal, that Jesus is powerful, that Jesus saves. For me, carrying my cross began, became clear in college. I made up my mind that I was going to be sold out for Jesus. I was going to die to myself. I broke up with my then boyfriend because I wanted to know Jesus as the lover of my soul and I needed no distractions. I committed to not dating anyone during those four years. I went to Bible study, rain, snow, shine, it didn't matter what the weather was. I walked and got there and the pastor would take up offering and he was such a blessing because he would take up the offering at Bible study and then give it to the two college students who were there and we would have some money for the week. But God's word, I would study it two hours every day because I was hungry and I wanted more of God. And it was during this time that the Lord baptized me in his Holy Spirit and I was on fire. I started doing mission trips to different countries. But guess what? Life was not easy. There were times that I had to shed tears and the Lord was removing layers of stuff in my life and it was painful. He had to change my identity because, see, my identity had been in my grades. I was a straight-A student. I graduated salutatorian of my high school, and I thought I was on top of the world. But the Lord had to humble me and realize that my identity could not be in what I do, but my identity had to be in him. And so as God began to do those things, there was a time where I could not afford to live on campus. And so I had to go live with my mentor at the time. And I'm thinking, Lord, I've given up everything for you. I'm studying your word, I'm serving you, I'm living right, yet all these people around here living in sin got all this money and they can stay on campus, but I can't afford to stay on campus? What is really up with this? But the Lord said, carry your cross. See, it wasn't about me, it was about my Vietnamese friend Tui. We had management classes together and we were in the same business groups and we had meetings till 1 or 2 a.m. And I couldn't take the train back to my mentor's house and so Tui let me stay with her. But Tui was Buddhist and she had these little Buddhas all in her room and I just couldn't sleep there. So I had to get my anointing oil and anoint the Buddhas and pray for Tui's salvation so I can sleep in peace. And the next time I came to her apartment, all the Buddhas were gone. And I hadn't talked to her about it, but for whatever reason, she removed the Buddhas. And so we would st I would study the word of God and I would pray. And one day we were walking back to her apartment and she says, how is it that you can trust this God who would allow you to suffer like you are and not provide you with the money that you need on campus? And so it was an opportunity for me to share with her the love of Christ about the sacrifices that Jesus made for me on the cross and that the comforts that he gave up, gave up so that I could live and that there is no greater love than the love of Jesus. So the suffering and pain that I have to endure does not compare to all that he has to offer. And so one day as she was sick, she asked me to pray for her and the Lord healed her. And then before the semester was over, we prayed to receive Christ as her Lord and Savior. And so, see, my suffering was not about me, but it was about Twee's eternal salvation. Your struggles and your pains are not about you. God has a greater purpose. Press through the pain. Trust God. Pick up your cross and carry it. There are people watching you. There are people watching your response because they want to see if this faith thing is even worth it. There are people who are going through similar things who, need to sh who you need to share your experience with and give them hope. My testimony of attempting suicide at the age of 10 was the word that one girl needed in Guyana that very exact day that she had planned to give up her life and the Lord sent me over there to share that and she decided to receive Christ and choose life that day.
So continue to persevere and press through your pain. Even if it hurts, keep walking. Even if things seem to get worse, keep praying, keep serving, keep pressing because God will reward your faithfulness. See, this year has been a difficult year for us and for me with lots of stuff going on with financial strains. I received a promotion on my job in, in the area of area director, but I had to endure a year of pushback from HR. And I worked a year with extra responsibilities, with extra time, taking work home without being compensated. It was an ongoing battle. And it was the first time in a long time that I broke down crying for days. I was so stressed that I had to escape to Boston to stay with my mentor for four days just to get the, the spiritual nourishment I needed to get back in the race. I needed to just rest and be before God and to hear what God is saying because I knew that God was calling me to this role because he had given me so much favor. He had opened doors. Everything was going well. Things were being approved and God's hand was on it. Yet I had to carry this cross. I still gave faithfully. I still served. I still ministered. Going on this mission trip to, to Suriname with three family members, the finances were not there. We really could not afford it. But God said, go to Suriname and lead this team. And I thought it was crazy, given a difficult place, given a difficult year, but I had to obey God. And I was praying, and the Lord said, you have not because you asked not. And so I got up one day. And I wrote letters to people at work, to family, and people gave beyond expectations that all of our costs was fully covered. Even a coworker, I'm not best of friends, we don't do a lot of things together, but she gave $450 because she said, you are doing God's work, making a difference in this world, and I believe in what you are doing. And so in the midst of it all, God has been faithful. He has provided everything we needed. He has rewarded our faithfulness. And in the end, people will know that God never forsakes us and that he truly is our provider. And he's already began the breakthroughs because my, finance, my promotion finally came through right before we left for Suriname. And I learned some valuable lessons in that process about speaking up against injustices. But well, that's a different topic. <laughs> so I'm not just speaking about stuff I don't believe or haven't lived. No, I'm living this stuff now. Even preparing for this message, the enemy attacked my body. I had all sorts of stuff going on in my body this week, even now, but I'm pressing. Because God wants me to speak his word. And despite the challenge, the pain, the sufferings, no matter what we go through, we've got to continue to obey God and do what he tells us to do. And so are the pains in this life worth it? Yes, because my life is about glorifying God and proclaiming his gospel. And suffering is part of being a disciple of Christ. The cross cannot be removed from Christianity. But Jesus helps us carry our cross. He gives us grace. He gives us strength. He surrounds us with support system. He gives us joy. And we have the hope that after the cross comes resurrection. So we know that there are eternal rewards. And for some disciples... This cross does involve following Jesus to physical death. In places where persecution exists, this is a daily reality. Christians are beaten, they're tortured, they're killed for their faith in certain parts of the world. But this should be the level of commitment for all Christians. The Lord promised to bless those who are committed to him, but he never promised that we would not have difficulty along the way. 2 Timothy 3.12 says, in fact... Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I've met people around the world who were tortured and forsaken by their family. They had a firm resolve that to live for Christ is Christ and to die is gain. All of this pain and suffering was worth it because they had their eyes set on the eternal rewards. In America, we don't have an idea of what it means to be martyred for the sake of Christ. But our persecution comes in popularity, going against the establishment, losing our jobs, not being politically correct. After we deny ourselves and take up our cross, and Jesus says, follow me. It is only when we deny self and take up our cross can we follow Jesus. To follow the way of the cross means we stop follow following the selfish ways of the world. We stop clinging on to stuff that can cause a barrier between us and God. Then we follow Jesus. In Revelation 3, Jesus confronts the church in Laodicea about the lukewarm attitude towards him. He tells them that they should either be hot or cold, but since they are lukewarm, he will spit them out of his mouth. See, God does not want half-hearted devotion. You cannot serve God and this world. 
Jesus gave his all for us on the cross, and in return, he's looking for living sacrifices, people who are wholeheartedly devoted to him. There is no gray or in between. You either live for Christ or you don't. The Apostle Paul gives us a great example. He was falsely accused by Jews, arrested, tried by the Roman authorities, shipwrecked, years later, still in prison, yet he writes in Philippians 1, 12 to 14. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. See, Paul was not concerned about the comforts and pleasures in this life, but he recognized that his suffering was for the sake of advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ, and for that it was worth it all. Yeah. Being a disciple of Christ is not an instant turnover, it's a journey. A journey of sanctification, of commitment, of learning, of failing and getting back up, but determined to finish the race. We won't get it right all the time, but it is having that commitment to keep trying, to keep surrendering, to keep dying. What we have to realize is that we cannot save our lives. Mark 18, 35 to 37 says, for whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. Jesus confronted different audiences with this same message. To the rich man, he said, if you want to be perfect, go. Sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sad because he had great wealth. And so he was not truly willing to die to his riches in order to follow Jesus. To the crowds and disciples, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate in manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. On hearing this, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said, does this offend you? The spirit gives life. The flesh counts for nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and they are life. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. See, the word of God is tough. And if we really read it and really want to live by it, it's tough. It offends some. And as a result, many will not follow it. But Matthew 10, 39 says, anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves his son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And so if we love anything else more than Christ, we're not worthy of him. And if our priority is earthly and pleasure pleasures and desires, we have already lost our lives. Have we counted the cost of being a true disciple of Christ? When we commit our lives to Jesus, our faith should leave us, lead us to turn from our sins, to turn from self, recognizing that my life is not my own. It's no longer about me or this life alone, but it's about Jesus and his kingdom. If you're presented with the option, deny Christ or die, would you deny Christ or stand firm in your faith? Do you love life more than you love Christ? You cannot save your life or your soul by denying Christ because once you have denied Christ, you have already lost your life. For what will a man exchange for his soul? Is there anything really in this world that's more valuable than Christ that is worth selling your soul? I met a man in Haiti several years ago when I was on a mission trip there and we were at the house all asleep and then this man came in the middle of the night and just started yelling and he was cursing God and screaming and then his tone turned from normal to demonic. So the, the guys went outside and we were all there listening and they started questioning this guy and said, what is it that you're doing? Like, who are you? And he began to explain he, was a, he used to be a wealthy and successful man. He had a very successful construction company. He pulled out his certificates that he carried around in a one bag that he had. That was all his possessions. Well, he gained his riches, but he had to do some things in return. He had to sell his soul to the devil. 
And so although he had those riches, eventually he lost everything. He lost his business and he lost his riches. And now he believed that God would never forgive him because he had given his soul to the devil and his sins would never be forgiven. And they tried to explain to him that Christ can forgive all sins. He can still make you whole. But this man, so lost, he refused, left with his certificates in his bag and his soul lost to go sleep in the graveyard. See, whatever the devil is offering, it is not worth your soul. If you're selling your soul for anything else but Jesus, you're going to lose it. So it's best to give your soul and to give your life to Jesus because Jesus is the only one worthy of this kind of commitment. Jesus says, if anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory. It's that simple. If we deny Christ, he will disown us. Don't be ashamed of Christ or being a Christian. The disciples gave up everything and followed Jesus. Paul said, however, I consider my life worth nothing. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the gospel. We have to turn away from a gospel that is not costly, that is only socially acceptable, entertainment-oriented and self-centered to a gospel where everything else is considered loss for the sake of knowing Christ. As committed disciples and followers of Christ, we need to study and live the word of God. Without the word and application of the word, we will not have the foundation we need to be true followers of Christ. See, in America, there are multiple Bibles in many homes, but no one is reading them. There's no engagement. We have a generation of people who are biblically illiterate. People come to church, but they don't know the word of God for themselves. And that is why we have people in some countries who are eating grass and waving their underwear in church or giving their children to sleep with so-called pastors because they cannot discern for themselves the wolves and sheep clothing because they're not reading the word of God. The Bible is relevant to our lives. We can't just read it for the sake of reading, but we have to walk in obedience according to the word of God. Because James tells us that we must be doers of the word of God, not just hearers. The word of God is our source of life for this abundant life. The Bible corrects us. It matures us to be fit for every good work. If we're going to experience any change in our church, in our community, our nation, or even this world, there must be a renewed commitment to read and do the word of God. What kept me as a teenager and young adult was the word of God. See, I studied it for myself so that I would know God for myself. And God had placed people in my life who discipled me. There were two men in my church, and they got a group of teenagers together, and we would go to each other's home. And they're the ones who taught me theology. They taught me the teachings of Christ and how to live right and how to obey God. And we studied the word, and we fellowship, and then we went out and shared the gospel. We were putting the word of God into practice. And even though that group dwindled down to just two of us. It was the foundation that I needed to continue to live the life as a committed Christian to Christ. In college, I was a part of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, and they emphasized reading the Word of God, spending quiet time with God. See, without, we cannot endure the sufferings and pains in this world if we don't spend time in God's presence and in His Word. God's Word is like a double-edged sword. It sharpens us. It prunes us. It convicts us. It shows us the way that we need to live. It is our guide to life. And if we we don't read it, we have already lost the battle. The disciplines of, of life like fasting, prayer, and studying the word help us to exercise the soul so that we become useful vessels that bear fruit. Without those disciplines, we quench the working of the spirit in our lives. And we need to be okay with being different from the world. We need to bear fruit. Following Christ requires investment of time and energy and commitment. As Pastor C always does uh, with an acronym, I was thinking of an acronym for disciple. A disciple is one who daily dies to self to be devoted to Christ, one who is intimate with Christ, one who seeks first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, one who is a cross bearer, an image bearer of Christ, who's purpose driven, who loves God and lives his word, and who endures pain and suffering in return for eternal rewards. See, the Christian path is not one of empty belief, but action. 
active obedience. Jesus calls us to live out the commands that he left us in his word to the best of our efforts. Jesus promised that every sacrifice made for him and the gospel would be rewarded on earth, but mostly in eternity. Anyone who have left their homes, their families, or their lands will be blessed a hundredfold, blessed beyond measure. The greatest blessing promised is eternal life in the world to come. That will make it all worth it when we stand before the Lord and realize eternity has begun. As I come to a close, I have these questions. For those who may not know Christ, the question is, are you willing to turn to Christ? Do you know the joy of having your sin forgiven? Let Jesus be the lover of your soul, your everything, the one who gives you purpose. Love him more than anything else in this world. Turn to Jesus today, trust him, follow him, become his disciple, accept him as your Lord and Savior, because the choice we make regarding Jesus will last throughout eternity. And for those who have made Jesus your Lord and Savior, the question is, have you truly committed everything to him? Don't hold on to your sin. Don't hold on to your old life. Don't let anything hold you back from following Jesus. Give Jesus first place in your life and let go of those things that will not matter in eternity. Because if you have Jesus, you have all that you need and he is more than enough. And so we just want to give an opportunity. We won't delay too long, but for those of you who would like us to pray. Okay, thank you and you can come and we will pray for you because Jesus is opening his arms to you today and he wants you to have a personal relationship with him. And so we would welcome you to come and we will pray with you. And then for those who are saved and you just want to recommit your life, realizing that there have been other priorities, other preferences, other things that you have placed before God, and you want to say, Jesus, I'm willing to die. I'm willing to die to myself. I'm willing to die to my will. I'm willing to die to my preferences.